Hi everyone, my name is Victor Kang, and today I'm excited to bring you a fun episode of Zoocast series. We have Nathan Smith with us today. Hi Nathan. Hi, I'm Nathan Smith. I'm a third year PhD student in the Molecular Ecology Group, Professor Bill Amos. So Nathan, um, tell me a little bit about your research here. Uh, so I am a mycologist um, and I, uh, I work with all fungi. At, at the moment I'm working on a species called Bletus edulis. Uh, which most people know because it's an edible species. It's known by common names such as porcini um, or sep or the king bolete. And I'm looking at its population genetics um, and really seeing like, like how we can define a population of porcini. How does it interact with itself in populations? How does it interact with other populations? How does it spread? How did you get into studying fungus? Quite, quite by accident, really. When I, um, I started my undergrads, I did quite an uh, open undergrad. Um, and when I came here, I was very much into uh, infectious diseases and pathology. Um, and quite by accident, I kind of I fell into an uh, internship in um, a vascular mycorrhiza, which is a, a fungal symbiosis, and really enjoyed it. Started plant sciences and kind of like fell into that by combining a love of fungi and diseases into the reality of my, me studying plant sciences. Okay, that's interesting. So fungi and diseases, but right now, and right now your research has a, an element of diseases in it, or is it uh, mostly just the community population work that you mentioned it's earlier? Mainly the community population work. So I, I, I try and work in several areas, do some stuff in the history of uh, fungi and study of fungi, and I try and work with as, you know, as many people as you can. It's, it's quite, my college is quite a small group, so you just need to work with as many people as possible. Um, the issues of fungi and disease is actually quite damaging um, because people look at fungi and if you play word association, you get fungi, mold, fungi, disease. Um, and when fungi are bad things, uh, this means people are less inclined to support work in them because people just want to get rid of fungi. Um, you know, if, if people see a mushroom in their garden, it has to be destroyed. Usually it's probably harmless, but, you know, it's this association of negative thoughts that, you know, Michael just try and work against. Yeah, that's a very uh, interesting point. Um, I, I, I do believe that when people generally come across fungi, yeah, it is a slight negative connotation to it, but you, you definitely um, cast a different light onto them. There's a fantastic thing with um, uh, wild mushrooms. People are scared. And the, uh, the UK is a very mycophobic country. They don't tend to eat mushrooms in the wild. And um, people were always scared that they've eaten something poisonous. And it's lethal. And the, the reality is that um, out of the thousands and thousands and thousands of species in the UK, there's only five that are lethal, five or six. Um, and actually, there's 20 that taste really good. And I think what the role is like between the scientists and actors, you want to encourage people to go, fungi are quite wholesome. You know, that there's poisonous plants out there, you're not scared of plants. There, there's poisonous animals, you're not scared of animals. Um, spiders are an exception, spiders are just, you know. <laughs> but yeah, so that, that, there's that, that balance of like how, how something is perceived. Oh, cool. Yes, I, I mean, I had a fun experience in Germany where I was with my supervisor and he grew up in Germany and he just picked up several wild fungi or mushrooms and then we we cooked them later for dinner and it was i actually have never done that before but i understand you you go on um, edible fungi hunting or edible mushroom hunting is that correct i personally don't collect to eat it's um not something i'm involved with uh, for me it's a case of uh working in the area um, and working with foragers it becomes a lot more difficult if you also collect to eat uh, you need to separate yourself from that. But yeah, I, I do go on a lot of um, what are called forays, where people go out and you have, most forays are you go around and you um, like look at fungi, you try and identify them and you, like, you keep records of the fungi you find in this wood. But I also have been on collections where you're looking for uh, bleater sedulis or you're looking for chanterelles or you're looking for hedgehog fungi and you're going out there to collect two eat so it, it's again it's, it's really interesting how people interact with fungi the, the the multiple ways they do so is it like a an avenue of outreach for you then is, is the general public just joining in these uh, trips is it yeah it really is so um i work with the british mycological society 
um, which is the second oldest uh, national mycological society in the world, um, just behind the French. Um, and what I work on, I work in the education uh, committee, and we, we our big thing is UK Fungus Day. Um, on one UK Fungus Day, we encourage people to go out there and just go and look for fungi. And we work with a lot of local groups around the UK just to encourage people to hold an event, bring people in, and it kind of demystifies mushrooms. Um, mushrooms are very you know, locked into folklore and mysticism, and people you know, believe like, like magic mushrooms. That's, that's, that's what I get every time I get, I work in mushrooms. Oh, like magic mushrooms. People lock this into a sense of um, the unreal and the surreal, and you know, a large part of outreach is going, Look, here's a mushroom. It's not going to hurt you. You can pick it up. You can touch your face. This is fine. In fact, this one's edible. Um, and it, it depends on what side of the argument is here. But some people find that people who start foraging mushrooms then take on mycology as a more uh, scientific or naturalist hobby where they start identifying mushrooms for the fun of identifying mushrooms. So you, you talked a little bit about your undergraduate uh, studies and how you... Uh almost kind of stumbled into mycology. Um, how did you proceed from then onwards uh, for masters and, and then here? So um, I did my masters um, at Queen Mary um, in a course they did with Q, which is a plant and fungal diversity taxonomy and conservation. Uh, it's been a while, but th that, that was the course I did. And it was the first year of running that course. And it's um, this, this new partnership between Q Gardens Queen Mary and for, you know, 90% of the course who were based at Q. Um, and that gives a real chance to like fully expose in mycological research. Uh, you work with, you work, you know, the, the workroom is right above the fungarium, which is the, the, the biggest and best fungarium in the world. So you have this whole connection to mycological history and it really it enriches you. And, you know, you're, you're working with you know, some of the world experts in fungi. And it's, it's a way to really learn and develop and kind of explore new ideas in almost like a, a, a safe sandbox to be like, everything's cool, let's explore everything and it's all at hand, which is quite good. So what exactly is a fungarium? So a fungarium is uh, essentially a museum of fungi. Um, now, we've, we've got here, we've, this is the, uh, the trays of the zoo, zoology museum. Um, and what this is, is, it's very much like this, but instead of drawers containing insects, there'll be sheets containing um, packets which contain dried fungi samples um, and people collect these for a variety of reasons. Initially um, it was quite a fashionable thing to do is people would have natural history collections and if you were rich you would either collect your own or buy someone else's natural history collection. Uh, but increasingly as it uh, goes on, mycology is quite young and it became a way to teach yourself. You would learn about fungi by collecting fungi and studying them at home. A lot of fungi require microscope work uh, to identify down to species. And I think that's where it kind of comes from. And as time goes on, these collections amalgamate um, and you have the type species of fungi. You have, yeah, it's, it's a fantastic way just to study fungi and study distribution of fungi across time. Um, so yeah, it, it's a museum of fungi. So when you're looking through in the, in the fungarium, um, do these specimens still have colour? Uh, by and large, no. So like fungi come in a, a wide variety of beautiful colours. You have like purples, greens, reds, um, you know, a whole range of colours. And unfortunately, fungi when they dry they tend to lose a lot of their colours and they tend to all go different shades of brown. And this is informative uh, for some people, for some species for some identification, but it also makes teaching with fungi an uphill battle because, you know, we've got some butterflies here which have like beautifully preserved their colour and it's quite hard to go, look how beautiful these fungi are as you take out sheets of dry brown mush sometimes. <laughs> so yeah, no, most of them don't retain their colour. Um, but there is, there is definitely some shading there, it's just you, you lose a lot of the vibrancy. But there is still beauty in, in fungi, isn't there? Yeah, definitely. Um, I did a brief bit of work at Q before I did my master's, um, where I was sampling fungi for a research project, and I, I sat in the fungarium and went through the packets, and you have all these fantastic descriptions of like names and locations all around the world. Of, the, of these collections, and I remember one collection of um, a fungus called uh, Diplocystis writi, 
which is a, a very obscure fungus. It's a, it's a type of puffball, um, but it doesn't look like a puffball. Now, puffballs are uh, circular businesses where if you squeeze them, they, they, they burst out their spores. And this uh, Dipsis rhizo, it's found on the beaches um, of the Caribbean, and it looks like the scrapings of a barnacle. Like the scrapings on underneath a the ship, these, these little tiny little pockets of puffballs in one big cluster. It's absolutely fascinating to look at. The, the diversity in the fungi is, is wonderful. And, and, and that, that's the thing, I think people think of mushrooms, and they think of um, like chestnut mushrooms they buy at the supermarket. But, you know, fungi come in all shapes and all sizes. You know, there's the, there's the zombie fungi, there's coral fungi that look like um, like coral. There's uh, fungi, you know, fungi that are bracket fungi. There's a fantastic thing called a ping pong fungus, whose name I can't remember, which is bright orange. And it looks like, um, like a little ping pong bat and it, it grows high up in the trees. And it's actually invasive in the UK and, it, you know, you can find it in Exeter if you want to go down. There's so many different... Know, shapes and sizes and you know some fungi don't even produce fruiting bodies we don't know what they look like um yeah it's, it's really exciting so it sounds like you've been in a variety of places kew gardens studying researching and now you're here in the department of zoology at cambridge so uh, what was your um, journey here yeah well, it, it, it's quite a weird place my college is traditionally associated with plant sciences though um fungi are more closely related to people than they are to plants. Um, what happened is that when I worked at Kew, I ended up on uh, research on uh, Belize sedulis, and for this I required uh, some samples. And my supervisor um, at Kew, uh, Bryn Densinger, um, who, was the head of Kew at, who was the head of fungi at Kew at the time, uh, got samples from uh, Professor Amos in this department. Um, and so I, I applied to Cambridge and I got some quite open funding. I, I contacted um, Professor Amos and said, oh, I've, got, I've got this one, no, I've got this funding and you, you've got this wonderful sample collection. Um, let, let's do some fungal research. Um, and it, it's great. Um, uh, my supervisor, I think, got, got into fungi as a forager. You know, he comes in and he's really, really likes collecting fungi. And, you know, then started collecting them for science, just as, as a hobby. And he's suddenly built this huge collection of Belisus edulis samples, which um, all have you know, GPS locations, have, you know, like dates attached. Um, but it's absolutely fantastic and interesting to end up in a department like this, which doesn't have a history of mycological research. It, it's quite exciting to do something new within the department. Great. I think it's, it's really nice to have my college is coming into the department as well. Um, I have a very, very, very short history of studying uh, fungi as well in my undergraduate studies. Um, and I think they are truly understudied. I think they are, they, we need to investigate them more. There's so much to learn from them. You, you're completely right, like fungi is so under, understudied. Um, we know at best, and this is at best, 5% of fungal species. You know, and that's crazy considering fungi are the primary, you know, primary source of antibiotics, for instance. Um, and I think a large part of the issue is that mycologist is quite an unfashionable label. Often people work with fungi and like yeast. Yeast is a huge thing scientifically, but people who work with yeast don't see themselves as mycologists. And that causes perception issue because, you know, fungi are essential to research. You know, it's, you know, one of the top, you know, research organisms, if not the top, is yeast. But people don't want to identify as mycologists, and so it causes a struggle where people separate themselves from the organism, um, and it causes an image, image issue for mycology, because it's quite hard to go, like, we, we have, look, look at these victories we have, when they're not, you know, these people aren't identifying as mycologists. And I even had it, um, I went to a uh, talk, uh, series of talks recently, and this was organised by the British Mycological Society, and the people speaking... It's fantastic research, but a lot of them said, I'm not a mycologist, because I think everyone has this perception of what a mycologist is, and either feels that they don't fit into it, or that they're not good enough to fit into it. And it, it gets quite hard, because actually mycology is very open and welcoming, like, please come, you're my, you know, if you like fungi, you're a mycologist, in many ways, you know, if you, if you, if you like fungi, you want to study, and you want to learn, then, you know, please, please define as a mycologist, and I think that's what 
the issue we have in mycology is, is that we're already doing so much research, but there isn't no, there's a department of zoology, and there's a department of plant sciences, and these these are quite common, quite normal things. But it's not a department of mycology. I think uh, you, you want more mycologists to like, like put put a flag down and say that we are our research is good, our organism is good. So it sounds like uh, mycology as a community is very accepting and very welcoming. Um, how can people get involved? Yeah, well, it, it is. Um, I mean, the first things first is you know join your local fungus group. There's, I'm going to get the number wrong, about 32 groups around the UK. You know, the closest one to Cambridge is there's the Huntingdon Fungus Group that works around um, Hunt, no, Huntingdon. And you know, that would be a good step if people want to get like real key field skills. You can also join the British Mycological Society, which is a national overarching group, if you're more interested in more academic areas of mycology, or if you just want to meet people around the country. Um, also, just just pick up a book. You can get a fungal guide for a couple of quid from a charity shop, and see if you can get you no. Know, see if you can identify what you find. It, it's you know the fun's in exploring and finding out. That's fantastic. Well, I certainly learned a lot about fungi today. Thanks for coming in, Nathan. Thanks for having me. Thanks for watching today's episode of Zookas, and don't forget to subscribe so you can keep track of our latest episodes. Thanks.